Yes, thanks so much indeed. Thanks for the overly kind introduction. Thanks for the invitation. And thanks to Harry and Frank for setting up this exciting, small, fine quantum session within the conference on connecting with computability. Now there's bad news and good news coming along with this talk. The good news is that when we have a look on undecidable problems in quantum information and quantum many body theory, we will be at the heart of the matter concerning the question on the desk of what notions of undecidability or computability for that matter could have to do with meaningful and interesting problems in quantum theory. And indeed, we will not only have a look at a very simple example of this kind, but also walk a bit through what is known on this. I was specifically invited for this on short notice, and I will try to provide a little bit of a review at the end of this talk. The bad news is that things will be very basic. And for most of the time, stick to very simple example. To add insult to injury, this will not be even a new example. So this is not so much of a research talk about a brand new result, but rather a kind of an overview talk that aims at connecting to the main theme of the workshop. So what is this all about? So imagine someday you, or someone else goes into the lab and performs a quantum measurement using a measurement apparatus, what physicists sometimes call a stern Gerlach device, but never mind, that's just the name. So there will be a particle flying in and it will be measured in that it can take one out of K measurement outcomes, say K is two, three or seven, and it will fly out on the other side. According to the laws of quantum mechanics, this will not happen deterministically, but randomly with some probability. It will give you the measurement device and the, and the classical description there, and you can do all kinds of experiments with this. You can also concatenate these devices. And um, so that like, kind of that the, the output of the first is, is, is the input of the next and, and, and so on. This is a very natural setting that's basically just the, the, the basic plain vanilla setting of quantum measurement. And there's a tree of possibilities of paths that the particle can take. And it's part of most basic quantum mechanics courses. It is elementary quantum measurement theory after all to find out what the probability is of the particle taking a specific part. I've given you the cross operators that determine the measurement. And then one can ask all kinds of natural questions and a particularly easy and natural seems to be, is there an empty port? Meaning, is there some output where the particle will never fly out or with exponentially suppressed probability? So this is what we fancifully call the measurement occurrence problem. So given a description of a measurement device, decide whether there exists a sequence of outcomes, W1 to Wn, that can never occur regardless of the input. So natural and easy as this seemingly is, this happens to be not only a computationally hard problem in the quantum setting, but in fact, a Turing undecidable problem. Whereas the natural classical analog is a perfectly decidable problem. So if you want, Undecidability is here a genuine quantum feature in the sense that destructive or constructive interference seems to matter. Now, this is also the simple, the, the simple close to trivial example that we kind of have in mind for most of the talk when we look at undecidability of measurement occurrence. Then we have a briefer look at a practically more important um, but also more technical problem on the undecidability of the positivity of tensor networks, where we only have a quick look at the kind of logic of the proof. And at the end of the talk, we'll have a kind of review as an outlook and look at undecidable problems by other authors and really basically look what's out there in the literature. Good, undecidability of the measurement occurring. So this is a fine broad audience, so it cannot hurt too much to remind everyone a bit on what quantum and classical states and measurements are at the end of the day. So in, the, in classical 
probability theory states are probability distribution. So in the final dimension setting, just vectors with non-negative entries that in their sum are normalized to one. On the quantum side, this vector of non-negative um, entries is replaced by uh, matrices, which are positive or positive semi-definite, which are in their trace normalized to one. So you replace the, the probability vectors just by density operators by positive semi-definite um, matrices. Devices in the, in the classical world would be sub-stochastic matrices, so that if you sum them up, would give rise to stochastic matrices, meaning mapping probability distributions onto probability distributions, where on the quantum side, you would have Krauss operators, arbitrary operators that um, label in their label J, the specific measurement outcomes of, that is um, happening, that are in their sum normalized as AJ, dagger AJ is one, meaning that there's always something coming out in a measurement. A specific outcome would be in the quantum setting um, obtained by a conjugation of the state of the density operator with the, with the cross operators normalized. That's the state assigned just directly after the measurement with the respective classical analog on the right-hand side. So a specific path, a specific word of outcomes, W1 to Wn would be um, obtained as a, or would be described by a expression of this form, where we have the, the, the trace of all these A deckers and A's and the, and, and the um, quantum state with the respective um, expression on the right-hand side in the classical world. That's kind of an overview on quantum and classical states and measurements of the kind that we will have a look at subsequently. That's great. Um, so an impossible sequence, one that will never um, happen, is of the form, it, a moment of thought, of thought reveals that, um, of, of this form here, so that the, the product of the respective cross operators is just zero, or the product of the respective Q, um, Q matrices on the right hand side. So the statement is that the quantum measurement occurrence problem is undecidable for k larger than nine. So it's not the, the plain vanilla stern gerlach device if, if you want, but a, um, a device with nine outcomes, but that's still small. And D, the physical dimension being 15, um, this is an undecidable problem. Whereas for any k, any number of outcomes, and D, any dimension, the classical measurement occurrence problem is decidable. So this is a very simple statement and also a very simple argument. It's actually simple enough that we can really walk through the entire argument, um, which I do because I think it's kind of instructive to go um, through the, the, the basic steps so that you see where this is all going. So this um, problem has already the flavor of a known problem called the matrix mortality problem, which states that, or the, 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 the theorem states that it's undecidable whether the semigroup generated by um, matrices with integer entries, d by d matrices with k, the number of matrices larger than eight, and d, the, the size of the matrix contains the zero matrix. That's related to the upper left um, uh, corner problem where you ask whether there's just a zero in the upper left corner, but here you ask whether in the semigroup, so possible products of these matrices, there is the zero matrix at, 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 at some point. Now, this problem is um, related via a polynomial reduction to the PCP problem. That's not the, the, the PCP problem as we know from um, Hamiltonian complexity, but, but a different PCP problem. It's the, the post correspondence problem, going back to work by Post, who made seminal work on the foundations of computing at the time, and also Turing made his um, seminal contributions to the foundation of computing, which states that given a finite alphabet, so that like, for example, ABC or so, and words uh, over that alphabet, ABA or so, suppose that we are given two finite sequences of words, S1 to SM, and T1 to TM, the PCP problem asks whether there exists an N such that there is a sequence W1 to WN of indices within the um, set of like one to, one, one to M, so that SW1 to SWN happens to be TW1 to TWN. So that it's a kind of a dominant problem, whether you can kind of put the 
these um, chunks together so that the over the resulting wall that you get is just the same. And this is um, actually an undecidable problem, again, um, shown via a polynomial reduction relating this problem to the halting problem. And, and, and specifically, there is a polynomial such that exactly when the Turing machine accepts an input after n steps, there is a solution of the corresponding PCP problem instance of length P of n, and then you have the understandability of the matrix mortality problem. So that already surely has the right flavor. It's like about semi groups and so on. It this the little piece missing is that this um, constraint that a dagger dagger aj is one gives additional information that we have to massage in. Um, somehow and, and respect in, in, in the argument because that would give additional structure that's not present in the matrix mortality problem. But this we can easily fix um, in the following fashion. So you have to encode matrix mortality problem instances into the quantum measurement occurrence problem. Now the matrix mortality problem is already undecidable for eight integer three by three matrices. So we take such an instance M1 to M8 in the integer matrices and then construct this matrix mj dagger mj that in general will be whatever but not the identity but it will be just something now we add further matrices diagonal matrices that are set up to, to kind of massage um, things from the right hand side we, we, we multiply these matrices from the right hand side and set up uh, 32 matrices m um, of, 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 of that kind we can do that so that the sum mj dagger mj over all these two matrices now is a perfectly diagonal matrix. Let's, let's put that up here. Um, and now there's a statement coming in <laughs> dating back to the, to the late 18th century, Lagrange's four square theorem, which is a, a cute insight that any non negative integer can be written as a sum of four integer squares, which is precisely as we want if we want to kind of patch up the matrix by squares of diagonal matrices using this Lagrange square, four squares theorem, we can just patch this up with four additional well operators that take the role of cross operators to make sure that we up to a constant get nothing but the identity matrix. So the sum of all these now 36 M matrices is just the identity. And from this, we can construct cross operators that kind of line up these matrices one after the other so that the, the interesting stuff is happening on the, on the left upper block where the, the matrices A9 are uh, just set up to make sure that the normalization is, is satisfied. J equals one to nine, AJ dagger AJ is one. And uh, with the property that if, if we have an instance of the matrix mortality problem, so if, if this also if this, this this product is zero, then the the upper left three by three block of a one or a j n to a j one is zero, so the upper triangular matrix is zero as well. So the matrix is nilpotent. So there is some m smaller than fifteen such that the the power of a to the power of m is also also zero. So we have constructed a a, a, a matrix of the right type. Um, for any um, instance of the matrix mortality problem. That's very simple. So the quantum setting is, the quantum measurement occurrence problem is in fact an undecidable problem, despite it being quite easy and natural. So again, any instance of the matrix mortality problem can be related to an instance of the quantum measurement occurrence problem, um, ending the argument um, here. That's the quantum setting. The classical part is even more straightforward, but actually also um, in, in, in a way uh, interesting in that now we have the product of matrices with non-negative entries, but it takes a moment of thought to see that we can look at the problem in, in even simpler terms, namely replace the entry-wise non-negative matrices M by their indicator matrices that just indicate whether the respective matrix entry is zero, then this indicator matrix, this entry is zero or non-zero, then the indicator matrix element is one. It just kind of indicates whether there is something in the matrix or not. Um, and that's interesting because then we can define a new product 
of indicator matrices. And this product of indicator matrices is the product of indicator matrices indicator matrix. So that's um, just the indicator matrix of the of the regular product of indicator matrices. And it takes a moment of thought again that this is a meaningful product. And the insight is that the the product of these non-negative um, uh, entry-based matrices is zero exactly if the product of respective integer uh, indicator matrices is actually zero. And that makes the problem much simpler because then it's ultimately a combinatorical problem at, at, at hand. Specifically, every element in the finite semigroup generated by these indicator matrices can be written as a product of at most two to the power of d squared terms, which is a finite number. Why is that? Well, um, <laughs> well, co consider a, a generated matrix M and think of some product of indicator matrices that's the shortest sequence giving rise to the respective indicator matrix, which means that any other sequence that, that is shorter will give rise to a different indicator matrix because otherwise it would not be the shortest sequence, right? So that means you, you take one off and you get a different element and you could do this again and it get a different element and, and a different element and so on. So if you look at all partial products, they must all be different. And then you turn into it a counting problem and then you just see how many elements um, you have. So, and why is that possible? Because the, the original problem has been replaced by a problem over indicator matrices. So that is, one can decide the problem over finite many terms, just checking over the, the, the problem over um, finitely many instances. Okay, that, that's it. So the, the classical measurement occurrence problem is perfectly decidable. And um, well, because the, the matrix mortality problem for these matrices with non negative entry matrices is um, also decidable. And, and this is how it all, all comes together. Okay, so this is um, it for this instructive um, example. So the the quantum measurement occurrence problem, going to a lab, finding out is there a sequence that will never occur, is um, has like destructive interference. It's an undecidable problem, whereas the respective natural classical analog with um, classical apparatus working on probability distributions is a decidable problem because we have only constructive interference, no negative signs that can cancel terms and we can just um, decide this based on a finitely many um, uh, combinatorical uh, um, cases. So in, in, in a sense, it can be said that undecidability of measurement occurrence happens to be a quantum feature of, of the kind. This is for the precisely zero probability. So this can also be made robust in the sense that the same statement holds true if you ask for an exponentially small probability, but let's not go there and, and rather move on, but this can be made robust in this natural sense. So there is a meaningful problem that can be easily stated that relates to like 101 first year quantum mechanics settings, and yet they are undecidable, Turing undecidable in, in, in the sense as we have it in mind for this, for this workshop. Wonderful, so let's move on and look at the undecidability of the positivity of tensor networks. So what is this? Now, tensor network states are ubiquitous in our description of quantum many-body states and, and, and physics for that matter. They approximate natural quantum states of matter in a precise and um, accurate fashion. There's a huge body of numerical work that builds upon this insight that indeed tensor network states capture what is sometimes called the, the physical corner of, of, of Hilbert space. At the same time, there's an maybe almost as big literature on mathematical physics stating in what precise way tensor network states like really um, kind of map out the, the, the states that are reasonably encountered in locally interacting quantum many body systems. So, um, this, this picture here shows a, a one-dimensional instance thereof in the familiar Penrose rotation. Those, that is these physical indices going down and th these, these respective vectors, state vectors are obtained upon contraction of the tensor network. So summing over the indices um, up here. 
So I will not go into detail, but just say that um, that, that these um, these quantum states that have a small description, a polynomial description in general, if all these matrices are the same, all these tensors are the same, sorry, um, it would even be a constant um, size description that uh, describe quantum states within an exponentially large Hilbert space. So that's an enormous reduction of, 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 of complexity, which is why these states are so important. So this is um, well understood in, in, in many settings and extraordinarily well understood in, in, in specific settings, in particular for pure ground states of one dimensional gapped local Hamiltonian models. This is enormously well understood in that in particular, they provably well, these states are provably well approximated by matrix product states in that one can really um, spell out a, 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 a matrix product state, basically parameterizing these pure ground states of mat of gap matter um, to an, a, a very good approximation in an extraordinarily strong set. In fact, in, a, in the sense of a trace norm approximation of the full quantum state. But there's also many variants thereof. So the, 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 the question of how um, pure ground states are well described by um, matrix product states is, is really um, enormously well understood. So that's the, the, the pure state setting. What's um, not quite as well understood, but there's also theorems on that, and there's also a, a huge um, literature is the, the actual quantum state, so the mixed state analog, the density matrix analog of matrix product operators. And um, for example, mixed sta uh, Gibbs states, thermal states of, of, of matter are probably in some way well described by matrix product operators, but you can also think of stationary states of dissipative Lavillian systems. And, and, and so on. there's loads of settings where actual states or positive operators are expected to be well approximated by matrix product operators. So tensors of this, of this kind. And the literature down here kind of is a kind of sample set of literature on this, on, the, on this, on this problem. That's yet an interesting like field. There's also a, a big numerical field and, and, um, and that's a, a good body of, of literature thereof. Um, interestingly, like the, the, the third paper on, on, on the list here is um, excited about this, but also complaining about um, numerical issues. So there's numerical methods are often marked by instabilities, numerical instabilities. There's small negative eigenvalues come into place, but it's hard to keep things like, stable and, and quite positive, which you have to have, because otherwise it's not a quantum state that you're describing. The, Statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics requires the the, the, the dudes here to be to, to be non-negative. So there is a bit of an issue that these um, matrix product operators are not a, a positive standard by their outset, but one has to kind of impose this somehow algorithmically. There are kind of some complaints in the literature that this seems to be um, not so easy. So the, the 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 question at hand is: Is the matrix product operator that you have? In your head, in your computer, whatever is is a positive operator and hence a, a, a quantum state. So, well, in slightly more fanciful terms, what you need to have, of course, is that the the family of all matrix product operators of a given length would be positive. And in even more fanciful terms, you can formulate the matrix product operator threshold problem if you want that as an instance would be of of the type you 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 give the matrix product operator tensor, so the M's of the, of the matrix product operator and the left and the right boundary condition, you have a teeny weeny threshold, 10 to the power of minus 10, and a system size N. And the question is whether there is an N, a, a system size, so that the matrix product operator plus this mini threshold identity is not a positive semi operator, so that up to this teeny weeny threshold of, of error accuracy, um, this would not be a positive operator. So this is a problem that you need to tackle when you want to have a meaningful, numerical, stable um, algorithm that works with matrix product operators. So that's just the, the question, is the tensor network basically a quantum state, if, if, if you want? That's, again, a very natural problem. Now, that's actually a practically important problem, because that's like behind the scenes of, a, of any numerical algorithm that describes like dissipative, open, thermal, whatnot quantum systems. But again, interestingly, this problem 
is an undecidable problem. Um, the, the bounded version, there is less many variants thereof that are also undecidable that we also discuss in quite some detail in this, in this work. Actually, there's even a bit of a, a review <laughs> at, um, at the beginning of uh, variants of the problem. And we saw that, that the bounded MPO threshold problem is an NP hard problem. So, um, so the MPO threshold problem is undecidable. And what is interesting about this from a conceptual point of view is that the the hardness of the problem or the understandability of the unconstrained problem is kind of has a, has a kind of mirror in, 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 the, in the practical world in that um, numerical algorithms are like unstable and so on. And also the, the, the very hardness of the problem or the undecidability can be seen as a, as a guidance towards where to look for, for, for stable algorithms. And indeed there, also we have published on this, but there's also other literature on um, variants of the algorithm that make sure that the involved tenses are like positive from the outset by construction. So that both there's a, a mirror of the hardness or the undecidability into the practical numerical realm and it gives guidance to, to where to look for when you want to get um, stable algorithms um, running, which is a kind of an interesting conceptual implication of undecidability. If you ask why would we would be interested in, in such problems in the first place. That said, the MPO threshold problem and many variants thereof that we lay out in the paper is undecidable. So I keep it short. I, I want to keep my promise on the on the length of the of the talk. So um, I only kind of throw in the kind of overall logic of, of, of the proof, which is now significantly more elaborate. It's in some way again related to the PCP problem or the, the bounded um, PCP problem related to finite um, length instances uh, where one uses an instance of the PCP and then kind of constructs boundary vectors and, and matrices of the right kind that um, relate the, the, the problem of the, of the PCP to problems um, on checking positivity of respective matrix product operators. We are now one makes sure of the so-called numerical representation of a map that's given by a specific map from, from words over um, a finite alphabet into non-negative integer matrices and then sets up a specific encoding that builds upon uh, work by these authors given down here as a, a kind of specific encoding to make sure that um, that one can, can, can prove that the MPO threshold problem is an undecided problem, again, by a polynomial reduction relating this problem to, to the, the bounded version of the, of, of the PCP. So the, the details are long and winding. They're given in this paper here, but it's, again, um, kind of some proof that involves the post-correspondence um, problem. Good. So natural and practically important problems for tensor networks describing quantum many-body systems can be undecidable. If looked at a specifically important instance, there's also others. But again, it's interesting to see that um, seemingly natural and, and, and easy problems that are the, at the heart of, of meaningful and, and important uh, discussions on how to capture quantum states of matter with tensor networks are undecidable. But also, Again, I, I, I'm repeating myself. I find it cute to see that um, there's kind of mirrors of that in, in, in reality and also the kind of the actionable advice aspect that um, the hardness of the problem relates to, to, to advice to numerically working scientists where to look for stable algorithms to kind of avoid these kind of pitfalls of unacceptability. Wonderful, which brings me to the end of the talk. Um, so this talk, we look at problems that are seemingly simple and easy, natural, and they are not, they are easy to state. They are related to like first year quantum mechanics stuff, like in the context of quantum measurement occurrence, where the issue is you go to the lab, you make measurements with stern galach type devices, and then you say, well, is this what's coming out? And, and is there an empty port at some point of the, of the measurement prescription? And well, seemingly easy as this is, this happens to be an undecidable problem in the sense of our workshop, which is kind of, well, judge for yourself, but it's a bit um, interesting. It's a bit surprising 
whereas also the the classical problem is is decidable here so you need the the negative signs in the in the interference so the the, the destructive or constructive interference seems to matter and the quantum measurement occurrence problem is undecidable, whereas the classical problem on stochastic matrices and so on is perfectly decidable. Then we moved on to the practically more relevant problem on checking the positivity of matrix product operators. That's again at the basis of important algorithms that describe many body physics um, in a kind of polynomial sized world, world. And even though that's again a natural problem, it's occurring in, in, in practical problems in algorithms, that's again an undecidable problem. Kind of challenging the way we think about uh, such 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 problems. These were the the two examples I put into the into the center of this. Um, so I was specifically invited also to give a, give a bit of an, an embedding of a, of a, a review what else is out, out out there, which I'm very happy to do. There's wonderful work on the purification of tensor networks that's actually quite related to the positivity of matrix product operators. That's again um, an undecidable problem. In, 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 in this sense. This works, less other problems in quantum information that happens happen to be also undecidable, um, different from the quantum measurement occurrence problem. One problem I've specifically thought quite deeply about, alas, with no success so far, although there's um, uh, interesting steps in that direction that, uh, that I'm happy to share when there's questions, um, is the question of the undecidability of the distillable entanglement where the question is given a um, an identical preparation of of quantum states in the in the ID setting can you perform local operations um, on, on, on two sides together with classical communication to extract um, close to maximally entangled states out at a finite rate and there's some evidence and there's some steps in that direction that this may need be an undecidable problem um, which would be interesting because that's a problem that's really at the, at the basis of entanglement theory, basically capturing entanglement as a resource, which would be cute um, to, to have. I'm happy to share, share more. But the, the mentioned problems here in quantum info, they are often like zero error type problems. And that of course is, is specifically amenable to studies of undecidability in, in, in this sense. There's also other resource theories, like entanglement is a resource theory where entangled states are the, are the resource. There's the resource theories of quantum thermodynamics where athermal states would be the resource. And there has been just work just a couple of weeks ago on undecidability of problems in, in resource theories on the quantum information side. Specifically important and interesting is the undecidability of the spectral gap that is um, true in two spatial dimensions. So this was first shown in two spatial dimensions, but later was also seen to be um, true in one spatial dimension, which is interesting because the, the, the spectral gap or asking whether the, 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 the gap, the spectral gap between the, the ground state energy and the, the energy of the first excited states and, and other higher up states is, is, is uniformly open in the system size is a concept that's at the heart of um, condensed matter physics or, or statistical physics in that that's in the in the very definition of a phase that you, you want to have such a gap and critical points mean that the, the, the gap is closing and um, a good chunk of condensed matter physics would plot uh, gaps as a function of system size and then argue that the gap stays open or uniformly open um, bounded from below independent of the system size and so on saying that we are in the phase of matter or that that um, you're far away from a critical point and so on the, the even the ontology of a phase requires to have a um, uniformly bounded spectral gap so that is an undecidable problem so strictly speaking um the the whole concept of a of a phase of matter is is, is not quite well defined in this sense and also, when you start making these plots, it could always be that at some point the, the gap is still going down and there's no a priori promise when this might or might not happen. So I can even think of size-driven phase transitions and that the gap seems to be open for, for long and then suddenly drops and you, you never know, know why and, and, and when. So that's kind of a challenge to the abstraction of an infinite system to capture natural systems of finite size, which is a common implicit assumption in, in quite a many ways here that this abstraction works, but here this abstraction is challenged and that 
it's not quite meaningful to speak of the spectral gap in the in the thermodynamic limit for like asking whether the spectral gap remains bounded from below um, independent of the system size because that's indeed an undecidable problem. This can be pushed further in, in further beautiful work by, by these authors here on the uncomputability of phase diagrams. Uh, well, asking whether you um, can compute a phase diagram with an additional knob, like additional parameter in the problem where relating to the, to the undecidability of the spectral gap, you can argue that it's also uncomputable um, to think of that phase diagrams can be, can be uncomputable in, in, in this sense, which is, um, uh, which is interesting in, in, in this sense. There has been just beautiful work, well, I talked about days ago by um, a friend and co-worker on, on a different field on, on quite machine learning, but, but never mind on the, on the undecided bit of learnability, where again, um, seemingly natural and important problems in now in machine learning type problems happen to be undecided. With a kind of similar conclusion of the, of the earlier type that you look at these problems, they look natural and, and seemingly like intuitive and easy. And again, they happen to be um, uh, undecided. And also there's work on uh, like quantum correlation that are the, at the heart of the, um, of the quantum nature of, of quantum theory, where the, the membership problem for constant size quantum correlations happens to be undecidable. If you look at the timestamps of these papers, I mean, this, this is just a couple of, um, well, this is a couple of months old, the other one is a couple of days old. So this is still alive and, and, and kicking. So people are really still deeply thinking about these, these problems. So there's papers coming out um, um, any time on questions of what seemingly natural, easy problems turn out to be Turing undecidable, relating concepts of computability, of undecidability to problems in, 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 in quantum mechanics, quantum theory, quantum information, quantum many body field. So what does this all mean? Um, well, judge, judge for yourself. I mean, in some way one can say that it, it implies that the properties that are commonly used in condensed matter physics, such as having a spectral gap, they're not quite well defined, if I'm honest about this, strictly speaking. So that means that the, the abstraction of a phase of matter or infinite systems describing something or even of a physical model of reality of a phase is not always meaningful. That's often taken for granted, but from a mathematical perspective, this abstraction of a phase is not quite well defined in this, in this sense. It also gives like practical guidance of the type that we've seen earlier, like in, in algorithms, when you say a problem is undecidable, you say, oh, okay, steer away from there, but rather look at the problem in a different flavor because you, the, the, the undecidable cases are the, are the bad guys. You wanna be like in the, in, in the complement somehow. So of course, mathematical physicists like to think about infinite systems, but, but again, this often, but not always makes sense. That's again, a lesson to be learned here. So, in some way, one can say that undecidable problems in quantum theory challenge our thinking of models as abstraction of physical situations, it seems fair to say. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to questions you might possibly have. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>